Okay, so this is the first long range only podcast. And to keep us somewhat in line, we brought on a veteran, Mr. <laughs> Ryan Avery from Avery Adventures. So he's going to uh, follow along here and uh, help us kick this off the right way. And uh, our podcast subject today is Is a 6.5 Creedmoor an elk rifle? So at the end of this, you will know from the experts. So first off, um, Furman, let's start with you. What, uh, what do you, what do you look at when you're getting ready to go for a hunt? What is an elk rifle to you? What do you pick out? Well, obviously there's going to be some compromises here because I think bigger is better. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm going elk hunting, I want bigger, but also I do believe that like a 338 really requires, or I would desire to have a little bit heavier rifle. And I don't really want to carry a heavier rifle into the elk woods. So I'm probably going to select a 30. Matter of fact, I've the, the elk that I've shot or the bigger animals in general that I've shot have been with a 30 cal, 30 nozzler, 300 PRC, 300 wind mag. And I'm going to pick a bullet that's, you know, 215 burger, 230 burger. Um, I'm looking for, the actual mass of the bullet. I prefer frangible bullets and based on experience from what I've seen with animals dying and the, the time that it required for them to die, it seems that mass plays a huge role. I know a lot of guys like to look at impact velocity and that definitely plays a role in how much expansion you're going to get. So it is important. And they also look at, you know, uh, the actual, Ballistic coefficients, the bullet, the velocity, velocity, which equates to uh, impact velocities and those things. But I have seen that with these frangible bullets, the more material there is to actually, uh, I hate to use the word explode, but, you know, go into the animal and then do its job uh, the quicker that they go down. So for an elk rifle, I'm not, I'm not taking a seven. I'm not taking a 6.5 for, um, so aside from three more just bore size i mean is there uh you know what obviously there's an optic that goes into that are you looking at a specific uh um power range is that going to be deterred uh, or is that going to be decided by the the uh terrain you're hunting maybe things like that is there something you have to have on an elk rifle other than you know getting outside of the cartridge side of things oh i i've bounced all around i like more i like more power um my first long range rifles were 32 powers. Uh, I've bounced back around. I've killed a lot of stuff with the uh, NXS uh, at 22 power. Uh, I've got a, I'm, I'm playing with the 20 power HXR that they just, re- Night Force just released. I really like it. Uh, it I go back and forth. I, I always think that I want the 32 power zoom or the more zoom and when i'm shooting and it's definitely enjoyable but i also do appreciate the extra field of view uh with the 20 power i i personally wouldn't go much below 18 power for anything uh that i am going to take in the woods for me it's all about opportunity i don't uh i i'm still a hunter i try to get close but Everything that I do, you know, have, living in Kansas and my opportunities to go out of state are either time consuming or uh, very monetarily involved and I want the best opportunity I can get. So that's what got me into long range in the hunting in the first place and all of my gear, all of my equipment, bullets, scopes, rifles, all that plays into that. So I wouldn't go below 18 power. You never know when you're going to use it um, or need it. And, you know, the same goes with the, the ballistics and the bullets and cartridge selections and all those things. Cool. Well, dad, what do you think? <clears throat> what, uh, what's the key, key components to go to them to an elk rifle, uh, before we get into the caliber side of things? Well, we've seen a lot of elk killed here. We, you know, with the unique position I'm in with managing a ranch and, and we did a management hunt a few years back where we actually took 76 elk off this ranch alone. And that put me at over 100 elk kills I was there for in one season. So I, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of it. And uh, 
we we obviously shot them with a lot of different rifles a lot of them were my rifles and at that time i was testing seven millimeter stuff and uh just 30 cal and up did a lot better job of putting them down quicker and a lot of times you're hunting and the situation defines a lot of things too and most of the time my situation is we're picking an elk out of a herd and a lot of times that's you know we know where they are and we got a choice of going into a big timber and busting them out in the middle of the afternoon or we set up on them three or four o'clock they start working they start feeding out of that timber coming out but so what i'm getting at here is it gets dark early during the prime part of the season and uh, they're a herd animal. If you wait till one clears the herd and you shoot that animal, and if it gets back in the herd and you can't get a follow-up shot on it, um, you're going to wish you had more gun if you were if you were under gun when you do this because I don't care how much snow there is or anything, if they're not leaking big time, um, even blood can get stomped out in a herd of 150 elk when they all take off after the shot. And if that animal gets back <clears> into the herd, and it gets dark on you and they go up into tall sagebrush or up over the mountain, it can be a real mess. I and mean, it can make for a long night and it can ruin a hunt. And so, you know, situations like that deter what you, you know, that, that's what decides what you can get away with. Um, you know, if you're hunting out in the flats and, and, and you can get 300 yards away, that 6'5 Creedmoor, we all know none of us here, I don't think will argue that a 6'5 Creedmoor or maybe even a smaller gun would shoot uh, you know, properly placed shot at a, at a proper distance for the cartridge would put an elk down, you know, destroyed vitals or destroyed vitals, but we all know how things go wrong. And if you're off the mark a little bit, that's when the bigger guns are going to cover your butt. And uh, I just don't feel very good about going out because I may have to make a 700 yard shot. And uh, if uh, I just don't feel very good about going out with anything smaller than a 30 and uh, everybody knows my favorite's a 300 wind mag with a 215 burger. I can't even begin to tell you how many elk we put down with that combo and a large, large percentage of those have been uh, one shot kills. So uh, that's, that's where I go. And Hey, I'm not saying a 338 won't do a better job because it will. So kind of like Ryan, if you want to pack the heavier gun and you can shoot a 338 well, that's not a bad choice. That's a real elk rifle. Mr. Avery, let's hear your insight. Um, I've, you know, offline, we've talked about this topic, the topic a lot, and I'll just kind of do the quick answer because for time's sake, I've, I've been fortunate enough to see a lot of elk get shot and I've shot a lot of elk. And for some reason I shoot a lot of elk, you know, right before, right before dark. And I noticed, I noticed one of the things I noticed is when I shot him with a, with a big 30 cal, and I'm not talking 30 out six, I'm actually talking like, say, let's say 300 short mag or bigger. I can shoot them once if I do my part. Even if I don't do my part, sometimes I can walk over there in the dark and I can find them to where when I was shooting smaller rifles, um, namely seven millimeters, um, I would get over there and I could find them, but it would take it would take a couple hours. So um, just to piggyback on what Ryan and, and Roz said is there's no replacement for displacement. And if you can shoot it accurately, and I don't care if it's from, you always see that argument, you guys are long range only, but from the rock side point of view, we're talking from zero yards to as far as you, you personally can ethically shoot. I would always take a big 30, whether I'm shooting them at five yards or I'm shooting them at 1250 yards. No such thing as too dead. No, no. And I think people, people always go to the recoil side of it. And my thing is, would, would I rather shoot a 300 wind mag with a 215 doing 2700 or would I rather shoot a 6.5 Creedmoor with a 156 doing 2700 or 20, I don't even think I'd do 27. I think it'd be like 2600 with a 156. I would much rather hit him with a 215 than a 156. Makes sense. So uh, kind of brings us on to our, our next uh, thing I got written down here is as far as bullet place, placement. And I'll just kind of let you guys talk about this free um, what do you, you know, uh, Ryan Furman kind of touched on a little bit about a fragmenting bullet, but, um, with a lot of new things coming to the market. And I think the, uh, new products are probably the, or the stuff that everybody was working on got shoved aside now that you can't even get the current production stuff. So, but with the A-tips coming out late last year, um, with your typical cup core bullets, um, cutting edge is obviously coming more and more, I think, uh, 
or more a uh, known name with the hunting industry as well, outside of the, just the ELR industry. What you got? Is that a cutting edge? One, yeah, 140. Uh, I might've known where you got some of those, but uh, what, go ahead and discuss it guys. What do you pick out? I mean, what's the, what's the advantages of one bullet over the next? I know, obviously I think everybody here hunts with uh, different types of at least builds of bullets at different times. So what makes you choose what, for what instance? Well, I'll, I'll start and these guys can follow up, I guess. Um, I've used, I've used quite a few bullets, you know, in three or four years ago, maybe five years ago, we really didn't have near the options that we have. And, and that goes with all the gear that we we're using bullets, powders, actions, stocks, all that stuff. But I've used quite a few of the bullets and the bullets that I see perform the best consistently are the fragmenting bullets. They go in two to three inches typically um, and generally, uh, obviously different ones have different uh, <clears throat> characteristics based on jacket thickness. That has to do with impact velocity, uh, bullet weights, um, all those types of things. So it's really hard to pile them into one, one, uh, basket, but they, they generally go in two to three inches and then they just, they fragment. So the copper jacket peels off, it goes in, it destroys the vitals. A lot of times the lead core will go out. A lot of guys, I think, confuse that for penciling and they get all hung up on the, that, but most of those guys tell you that the animal died within, you know, 30 or 40 yards. So I don't really understand what they're, they're griping about when they're upset with the performance, but the fragmenting bullets typically put bullet, put animals down quicker. Uh, we could argue all day long about what the cause is. I think it's probably causing shock to the central nervous system while it's destroying the lungs, just because those fragments go out, they probably hit the spine a lot of times they'll hit the, the heart and it and some of that obviously depends on where you actually hit it you know in a heart shot it's a heart shot it really doesn't matter what bullet hit it there it's going to perform for the most part the same these cutting edge bullets are actually pretty impressive for guys that are really wanting to use a monolithic bullet or they have to because of the area the area that they're they're using but those I, I california don't, yeah california i think Brian was talking about a hunt he had wherever they were requiring it, but it, uh, it seems to do what they say. The pedals flake off and it does some internal damage similar to a fragmenting bullet. And then the, the core of the bullet exits. I know a lot of people are hardcore about uh, the penetration and I don't think anything's going to beat the penetration. They're, they're going to get an exit. It had to be a pretty big, animal at a long distance for it to not penetrate and there's some of that stuff in africa but we're not going to have any of that here in the united states so um i i i think both for from what i've seen i prefer burgers the horn of days in my experience have done pretty pretty good and then i had some pretty good experience with cutting edge bullets this summer but uh or sorry this last winter but uh I, I really prefer the fragmenting bullets. They seem to put animals down the quickest. You shot anything with those yet, Avery? No, the cutting edge. I, I talked to everybody I knew, Ryan Bras, a few other people that have used them. I have a landowner where I'm going to go on a hunt that she requires them. So I'm going to try some 140s uh, out of a 6.5 Solomon on some deer and see how they do. Um, on the fragmenting on the fragmenting bullets, I often wonder if it's not the same reason why these you know, these um, honey or these rifle arms manufacturers don't make new calibers every other year. They come out with a new hunting bullet just to sell bullets because it seems like every couple of years there's a new improved premium hunting bullet. Well, I really like what Jeff says about he shoots premium killing bullets because I truly believe that fragmenting bullets match bullets are better killing bullets and, and it's not it doesn't matter if you take a acubond or a partition or a sirocco and you put it in the boiler room it's gonna it's gonna kill the animal it's why well, i like match bullets and especially burgers is you can you know you hunt long enough you're gonna f up some shots pretty bad and i think match bullets can save you with shit match bullets that are heavy hit on the heavy caliber side can save you on some bad shots and people say well you shouldn't be taking bad shots well, they don't live in the real world. If you hunt long enough 
And it doesn't matter if it's, like I said, again, if it's 100 yards running or you're taking an 800 yard shot on a bedded or, you know, broadside standing still animal, I'll take the, I'll take the fragmenting bullets every time. Out, but you can have too much. Like I'm sure Jeff can jump in on the A tips. I shot two animals with the A tips, very under impressed. They are too explosive. So you can go from you know the hunting side that are a little bit too strong to the too fragmenting side. That's that's exactly right. I saw the same thing, Ryan. I <clears throat> man, I was all about the 230, 250, 30 cal A tips and uh you know, they don't recommend them, but, you know, nobody does recommend these match bullets, but I've seen the same thing you have. You know, here's what puts animals down is destroyed vitals. Some people like the uh, the high shoulder shot and that sort of thing. I don't. I go for center mass vitals right behind the crease. If you got internal oil leaks so it's leaking blood, that animal's going to die and it's going to be dead when you get there. There's such a, if you take a high shoulder shot, You'll drop them when they hit the ground so hard that it looks like their legs hit their belly before they hit the ground. You better get another bullet in and get ready because you could have shot above that spine and into no man's land and hit them dorsal fin bones, you know, where the <clears throat> back straps lay, and it'll knock them down. They hit the ground just like hammer. You know, you know, man, them things are there. It's done, but again, let me tell you what, it'll gather up its uh, senses and jump back up and take off. So um, I don't. I shoot. I'm a vital shot shooter, um, the best I can, and that's. Fragmenting bullets do a good job there, and they will, uh, if you get internal oil leaks, your animal will be down and dead pretty darn quickly, and uh, that's the other thing, you know, if you do a central nervous system shot, you're going to be one of them guys that when you walk up to that animal and it's flopping around on its front legs trying to get away, you got to finish it off, and I do not like that scenario. I've had to do that too many times, and I hope I never have to do it again. You know, they're not the enemy. I want them down. I want them dead. I want them to bleed out. I want them to get dizzy, fall over, and die. And uh, that's why I go for the vitals on that. But back to the um, bullets that can be too explosive, I created the perfect storm, I'll call it. And, you know, uh, I had the eight tips going 3,285 feet per second. And I should have known, Ryan, you and I talked about this thing was shooting excellent. I should have known we wanted to get a 1,000-yard kill with those bullets to see what they'd do so we'd know and, we shot a bull one night at 1,028 yards right in the boiler room. And it stood there for a little bit, and it tipped over, and it died. And we went up and started field dressing that animal, and I noticed that just some fragments barely even scratched the far rib cage. This is 1,028 yards. I mean, it should have <laughs> – anything should exit or, or at least get close to it at that distance, and it didn't not. That kind of got my attention. I'm going to tell you something. Then we, uh, you know, we had a wreck with a uh, – a 300 yard shot with a cow and uh tracked that thing for about three and a half miles spitting lung out and everything else but it was lack of penetration that didn't put that animal down sooner and quicker and uh i mean i couldn't believe that it went that far after being hit with that kind of force so i attribute that I'm not saying anything's bad about this bullet you slow it way down it's going to be great but the reason you put a tip on a bullet is to make it expand if it's a cup core jacketed bullet, it don't need a tip. Not for hunting, not in my real world. The hollow points will do a lot better job. Now the cutting edge laser max, they're a solid bullet and they pedal off. And a lot of times their pedals on the, on the longer, um, you know, uh, heavier weight ones, their pedals will break into two or three pieces. So you get more fragments, but they need that tip. That tip's there for a reason. There's a tip there and there's a big void behind it. But, so I'm a fan. If it's a solid core or if it's a solid copper lathe turn bullet, I want a tip on it. If it's uh, if it's a cup core uh, match bullet, I don't want no tip on it if I'm going to hunt with it. So that's kind of and, and you know we get to this place in the world by by these experiences we're talking about. You know we see a lot of the same things over and over, and then you get to where you know it's like this ain't a good deal. You know we're headed for a wreck here, and that's why I back clear off of them. Hunted the rest of the season with a 245 burger at 3200, and uh, everything went back to normal, and everything was happy. You know so thinks that we're doing any of this stuff anybody that's in this group right here we all qualify here the same deal anybody thinks that any of us are using uh, or we're 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 promoting any product because that they advertise with us or whatever it may be that that's bs i ain't going to use anything for any amount of money when i go hunting i'm gonna use what i want to use and that's that's what we do we use what we want to use and what we're telling you is we test a lot of things and we see a lot of things and we it all comes from experience, not from anything else. 
one thing that uh, I don't remember who said it, but somebody said a while ago is you never, you can do everything you want on paper, but you don't know what that bullet's doing when it, until it goes into an animal at, at that specific instance and at that specific angle. And so that's things, not, no two shots are the same. So like you said, when you test stuff time and time again, heck, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Dad, but you had your uh, 338 Lapua in a Missouri deer hunt. I think we shot a doe deer at like 150 yards or something. And that, I think we were, you were still using 300 grain Sierra Match Kings at the time. And that bullet went through that whitetail so fast, it actually sucked intestine or whatever, long whatever it was out the other side and plugged the hole. There was not a single drop of blood in the snow and luckily I'd videoed it and it was, Oh yeah. We watched it like six times as it's dark. It's like, this thing's dead. It had to hit it. It had to hit it and end up following a little path. And there she was tucked up in this little, I mean, yeah, shoot, it wasn't on that trail and went into yeah, it wasn't 30, 40 yards, was. but yeah. it, it, it was crazy. It was the lung and everything was hanging on the outside and it's just, it's crazy wild what happens how every shot is different and the exits are That's different a good and, point. And, and we should talk about that you know <clears throat> guys you hear guys say all the time i won't use that bullet because it's not consistent you know well <laughs> let me tell you what is consistent you know your impact velocities are consistent you know at any given range you know but you got different impact velocities depending on your range but the bullets today are made so they're, they're so consistent that I don't know how you do anything different. So saying it's not consistent, that's not the problem. The problem, here's what's not consistent. The shot placement, the distance of the shot, the angle, the bullets coming in, the, the bone and, and the meat density of the animal. I mean, do you tick a rib going in or do you center a rib going in? Do you uh, catch the thick muscle on the back of the shoulder or do you hit mm -hmm. the crease and just you got hiding a little bit of meat and go between two lungs? Uh, that's what's not consistent. You know, shot angle, I, I can go on and on and on. There's never two shots the same. And, and that's why people see these bullets do different things. Oh, this one passed through. Oh, this one didn't. Oh, these bullets aren't consistent. That ain't what it is, boys. It's, it's, it's all about the difference we put into that shot. It's what we do because we're shooting uphill. We're shooting downhill. Like I said, a long range shot. I, I shot my moose in Alaska at 1,033 yards. That bullet went in. I mean, I was big up high on a way up on a ledge looking down and uh when i shot everything was good but where that bullet was coming in from way up above and coming down the angle that bullet was coming in at it looks like i shot eight inches low on where the exit was but where it went in was an x ring so for that shot hey i should have aimed another six or eight inches higher you know what i mean but uh but anyway i'm just my point is no two shots are the same, Daniel, and that's what you said, and that's, a, that's the exact right truth, and that's why you see different consistency result, different results in consistency in bullets. It's not about the bullet. Yeah, I have to, I have to jump in on that, though. Having, having said that, though, burgers have bailed me out of a lot of situations, and oh, Ryan, absolutely. Touched, Ryan touched on that just a second ago or a few minutes ago. So even though that consistency that's perceived may be different, I've made some bad shots for various reasons. I mean, we could go, I've made bad wind calls. I've had, I've shot, uh, you know, I shot a reed buck in Africa when uh, I got home. I was disappointed with the shot placement. When I got home, I realized that my scope mounts were loose, um, which is when I stopped using direct mount scopes. So that's a whole other, whole other topic. But burgers have bailed me out of a lot of bad situations. So whether, they were or weren't consistent. Uh, like you just said, it's, it's the shot placement and the shot angles and all those different uh, situations that are actually different. The burgers have always bailed me out. Um, I don't believe that a cup and core bullet would have gotten me out of those situations. The animal probably would have died, but not in the amount of time that the animals that I'm talking about actually died. So, um, I guess I don't see what those guys are complaining about. And another thing that I don't understand is I have six pretty much bang flop videos on my Avery adventure YouTube. And the main comment Shameless is plug. No, it's just, I just <laughs> want to, it's, you can go look at the questions and you can go look at the comments. 
Yeah. It's their bang flops outside of Tanya's elk, which was shot beautifully twice. It's you can't kill animals with match bullets. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You just saw six animals get destroyed. Yeah, we just watched it. We by just watched six it. bullet by six <laughs> by match bullets. What are you talking about? And I'll ask the collective here, where is this misinformation coming from? Is it the 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 actual companies won't back it up and they won't say, hey, these are hunting bullets? Or is it just people are that naive that they they don't know? People that don't don't know always seem to have the louder voice than the people that do. You know, the people that don't have all the time to be online and talk about what they haven't done. And the people that do it are, they don't care. You know, it's, it's, it's a, I think it's, I think it's unfortunately a a negative side of the internet anymore. I mean, look, look at all the different things over the years that have been, you know, just hammered on by skeptics or whatever, you know, I mean, we can get into all kinds of different things like, you know, burger bullets, everybody here agrees. We could pull somebody on here that heck I could get, find a guy in my hometown here that will that stopped using them because they were, they were penciling through and he's, he's shooting white tail and mule deer at like a hundred yards with a two sixty, And it's like, and then I, they always get mad when you ask this question. Okay. You're looking at this hide on a what? Oh, a dead animal. Mm-hmm. Okay. You pulled this bullet out of a, a, a dead animal. Oh, okay. And it just never clicks with them, you know? And so they go back to, I don't know, the Nosler or the soft, I don't know, PowerPoint Winchester bullet. I don't know what they use, but it's, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure you guys all can share my frustration there. bottom line, when it comes down to the quote unquote engineering behind a bullet, which maybe there are a lot of engineers making bullets, but they're not engineered. They're not engineered like your car. They're not engineered like the power plant I work at their design there's some scientific wild ass guesses involved and there's some testing involved <laughs> but when it comes down Thanks. to it there's really two two different types of construction there's when we're when we're talking about lead core bullets there's the bonded bullet and then there's the cup and core bullet and they both respond basically the same because the physics is the same one of them the bonded bullet it mushrooms the lead mushrooms and it retains the copper core in that and then you get that nice little pretty mushroom that i think all of us can appreciate i think everyone in this uh discussion can appreciate that mushroom but the problem is the bullet's all intact so all it really does is cause some vital shock as it uh, causes the cavitation through the animal and then it exits and it has a you know whatever let's say it's a 308 and it has like a half inch diameter exit but in the middle of that it's the hydrostatic shock that causes and it does kill animals it causes big nice blood trails usually and then the cup and core it really does the same thing the mushrooms the same on the lead core it's i mean it's the physics part that's actually making that mushroom happen the lead is getting hot it's deforming and it's expanding the only difference is the cup usually pull pulls away and depending on impact velocities will dictate how much of that copper is going to fragment whether it fragments is an entire the cup or of the bullet or it comes into pieces but they really do this the same thing except for the cup and core bullet has that additional feature or whatever you want to call it accident of the copper coming off and destroying all that extra material um i'll take it every time it broadens your where you put the bullet. It gives you yeah. it gives you, you like you, you said, still, like a, a variance almost there. You trade, so you still get the the cavitation that happens inside the animal. You trade a little bit of exit hole sometimes. I mean, if the if the impact velocity is at the right thing, you're gonna get a giant hole out of it no matter what bullet you're using. So that really defeats that advantage that some claim from the uh, bonded bullet but you always get that fragmentation that you're not going to get with a blunted bullet. But the, uh, the, the thing about where does all this come from, you know, I don't know what percentage, just say somewhere in a 90% of the people that uh, are listening or, or, uh, are trying to make these decisions. Uh, they get one elk tag a year, maybe one elk hunt a year, one deer hunt a year. And 
<clears throat> not everybody's in the positions like we are where we travel to different states or like I am where I take out many, many hunters here and we see all these kills. And, you know, I usually have two elk tags every year just for right here. And then, you know, I might go out of state, and shoot an elk too. I mean, so these people are only get one and they, they might go three years before they kill that elk, you know, so they, they don't get all this data that we get, you know, so uh, they, they listen to these guys that get on the internet, and start singing or get on Facebook and start singing. And you got to wonder how many, I can usually listen to what a guy's saying and tell you how many elk he's killed <laughs> pretty quick. I mean, I'm not trying to be cocky about it. But I'm just saying it, the guys that really kill a lot of elk or, or, that, or kill a lot of deer or do a lot. I mean, they've seen just exactly what we've seen, you know, and uh, the days used to be, you know, I'm working with an old uh, a rifle right now that I'm playing with just for grins just to do something different but it, it, this rifle was made in 1898 it's a 4082 shoots a 250 260 grain bullet at 1400 feet per second uh i was talking to bullet manufacturers today that, that make these cast bullets and they're saying that these things are they're, they're killing machines you know but hunt with it like you hunt with your bow but just take your rifle <laughs> <laughs> get close but they say you know i said well what about penetration on these things because i know i'm not going to get any you know i'm I, that cast bullet is all i'm going to get it's not going to fragment like what i'm used to and they said they'll go through a deer long ways at, at uh, 50 75 yards but uh, that's what those guys were used to so they're you know and i know i'm an old guy right but <clears throat> there's a lot of that old school stuff still out there uh, that you got to have an exit and you got to follow, follow a blood trail. You know what? I do. I prefer to keep watching through my scope and watch it go down. <laughs> you know, I, I don't need to track stuff. I can, I have, it always happens. If you go hunting long enough, you're going to be tracking animals. Then I despise it, you know? And I, I think I'm halfway decent and I usually find them, you know, but <clears throat> that's where it comes from. It, it's, it, we got to get past that guys. These bullets, if when you go in there and you have the shotgun effect inside a, a vital zone inside the chest cavity and you got major, major damage and destruction and huge oil leaks, that animal ain't going nowhere. They don't go nowhere with, with huge oil leaks. And that's what you want. I don't care if it's dripping out the side or if it's all happening in the chest, I don't care. But if I got a huge oil leak coming off that oil pump, it ain't going far. I'm no engineer like Mr. Furman, but, it didn't take me long to figure out that when I started shooting elk with 230 burgers, that when I walked up there, those wound, those wound channels were a whole lot bigger than the 200 grain Acubon. And I think all this kind of plays into something that uh, uh, Furman said before we got on here was, you know, what's, what's the whole point to stacking all these cards in your favor? And we just kind of touched on a little bit there with, with that is, you know, the, the guy that's taken his, once in a lifetime hunt um, to the west from from Florida or from wherever you know what's what's he need to know and the biggest things you want to do is you want to pull as many variables out that you can to where you're the only one and you know we've we talk about it in optics a lot you know what's the what's the warranty like on this brand versus that brand well <laughs> well when you have never had to use the warranty I think that's the best one because you can't put, you can't put that warranty on the wall after it, it took away your trophy elk, your trophy moose. You can't fill the freezer with that warranty. You know, it, we're, we're talking bullets and stuff here, but you know, you broaden your, your opportunities, I think is what Furman said that, you know, that's, that's why we get into long range hunting. We, I mean, I don't think anybody here would pass up a 400 inch bullet, a hundred yards, but well, if he was at seven, my, <laughs> you went. I didn't even hit him with my truck. The dog, who gives a fuck? <laughs> hit him with your truck well, and put a bullet in him so you could tag him. That's a good point, though. I mean, and going back to our uh, our beginning topic here, you know, it's a six five Creedmoor and elk rifle. Like I said, we all know that it'll kill an elk if you get that perfect placement and everything like that. But this, what about the? I talk to a lot of hunters every year. I mean, I talk to a bunch of hunters every year, and there's guys that come out here every year and hunt and hunt. And if they get an elk every three years, they're tickled. You know, does that guy, when he gets that opportunity and he's walked his butt off and he's hunting public lands and he's finally five miles in where the hunter pressure is less and he gets that shot. Does he, you know, even though we know that six, five Creedmoor will do a good job at 300. Well, now this, this elk is at 550 and it's a nice bull boy. 
I don't think I want to be uh, betting on that hand, you know, because I've seen these things. I've seen them run off with broken shoulders. I've seen them with one lung destroyed and go four miles. You know, I mean, we literally tracked one 4.7 miles that was leaking all the way one time. And when we got up to it, it was snowing like hell. It had bedded three times and it was laying on a trail looking back at us about 50 yards away. When we put the kill shot into its neck, its head was still up looking right at us. You know, that thing had one destroyed lung and one small hole through the other lung. And it went 4.7 miles on my GPS. So that's where the big gun covers your butt, you know, and, and but you got to be able to shoot it. If you can't shoot it properly, then you, then you got that problem. So make sure you can shoot it properly, you know, and uh, if you can't then get the break on there, you need, or whatever you need to do to be able or get the right stock on it, whatever. So you can be good with it, you know, and get that bullet where it needs to go. But if you're off the mark, a bigger bullet's going to be your friend. Yeah. I think in this discussion, we have to discuss why a lot of guys that I hear talk about what, you know, their cartridge choice and why they're going to those smaller cartridges. It has to do with shootability. And there is no doubt that even in the two same rifles, that 30 calibers are going to be more difficult to shoot. It's physics. It has more recoil. It's going to have more recoil, but with today's components and the amount of money, most of these guys, and I understand that some guys just can't afford it, but a lot of these guys are spending ridiculous amounts of money on equipment and <laughs> the four of us are no different, but the stocks are made, the brakes are made, you know, you get a big, I, I think one of the biggest overlooked advantages of carbon barrel is the fact that it allows you to have a bigger break with it, not being an eyesore, but all of those components will let you build a, you know, nine to nine and a half pound rifle all up uh, minus the bipod into a you know something that you can spot shot shooting 215 grain bullets at 2900 2950 3000 foot per second i don't think there's let any me, reason today there, Ryan. There, and and let me just throw this in there just a second and if you got too much recoil and you want to reduce that you don't necessarily have to do it with bullet size reduce the velocity because a lot of these fragmenting bullets work down to a to a, a slower speed you know don't go for, if, if you can't shoot it, it's a little much for you. You're not comfortable. You're not having fun. Don't look for 3000 feet per second because 2850 will do the job and do it as well, if not better. Okay. Yeah, no, sorry I, about that. Yeah, no, no, that's, that fits right in. It, it, it's, it's, uh, you do, just because we are suggesting a 30 cal doesn't mean you need a, you know, a 300 terminator great round, but maybe it's not the one for you. Maybe a 300 WSM is the right one. And it will push a 215, 2,900 foot per second. I've got one doing it right now. The recoil is very, very tame. Uh, but, you know, trying to we're, we need to try to steer back to the whole point of this was the 6.5 uh, cartridges. A lot of guys pick those because of the shootability. And no doubt they're more shootability, sh sh more shootable. They're easier to shoot accurately not that they're more mechanically accurate but it's easier for a guy or a woman to pick it up and shoot it accurately but some of those issues can be solved with the correct rifle build one thing That's i noticed true. that uh i think i don't know uh, i think probably i know Furman, you can attest to this because you live close to where we i grew up but when we moved out here my biggest learning curve was how dang tough western animals are i mean we shot coyotes and deer i mean you touched them with something they were done these freaking elk they pack off but big bullets like they didn't hurt them i mean it's crazy and then you know down the road they, okay they do fall over it's just that was the biggest thing and i think that's something that's never talked about for you know, since we brought it up, people that uh, are coming out here for the first time and things like that, I think that's a misconception. They're used to used to hunting whitetail and things like that from Midwestern or back east. And antelope are t way tougher than any whitetail we ever had in Iowa, wouldn't you say, Dad? Uh, they absolutely are. I mean, I, I've uh, geez, I've seen some things I just couldn't believe. It. Sit there shaking my head watching a watching a deer go over the hill that I just you know shoved a bullet in you know and it's especially when uh 
when I'm trying to video anything, video a hunt, they're, they're not going to lay down inside that where that camera can see them. They're going to go just over the edge of the hill, and that's where we're going to go down. And, and I, I think they, it's, I don't know, it's a black cloud. But anyway, uh, but don't overlook and you know the, the options we have. A stock makes a huge difference. You know, an example here: I build a 20-inch barrel, light, 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 6.5 PRC, shooting uh, 156 burgers at 20, right at 2,900 feet per second. And I designed this rifle, you know, with a thread cap protector, so I could run it with or without a break. I shot that little sucker, and this thing weighed like five pounds before I scoped it. And I shot that little sucker three times. Put it down, walked in the house, got the brake, come out, spun the brake on it, said to hell with that. I mean, so even if you go too light and everything, I'm just saying there's there, there's stocks, brakes, all these make a big difference. So make your gun shootable. I mean, don't be afraid to try something different and find what fits you and what works because that's everything. And I really, I mean, if a gun's built right, designed right, fit right, I really don't think anybody's going to have trouble shooting a, uh, a 30 cal. Yeah, and I... I hate to make the plug here for this but this is what our reviews all center around you know the stocks the brakes all those things are at least my reviews they're they're revolving around shootability so there's enough stuff out there to make a, sh a 300 uh wind mag a 30 uh 300 prc a 30 nozzler uh 300 wsm shoot very well uh, all of my rifles all my 30 cals i can spot shots uh 500 yards and beyond most of the time even within 500 yards so um it kind of takes some of that argument out now if you're just recoil sensitive i i actually don't think these recoil much but still uh, the fact remains even though you have a break on it that uh reduces recoil by as much as 50 percent uh it's still that number applies to whatever. So if you're shooting a, you know, a, a six, five Creed more with 20 foot pounds of recoil brakes going to take it down to roughly 10 foot pounds and a, you know, a 30 nozzler shooting at 215 with 40 foot pounds of recoil, it's going to be 20, but those numbers aren't something I think that most people can't handle. So, uh, the, I, I, I really feel that the equipment takes some of the argument out of the equation as far as, uh, the shootability now we've we've been talking about that for quite some time now but like i said it's one of the biggest reasons why i hear people uh, advocate for a smaller cartridge and if you just can't shoot a bigger cartridge then by all means shoot something that you can handle but i think the equipment today has taken a lot of that away what are those little rug rats you got behind you there was that a rat <laughs> <laughs> dude you got mice <laughs> it was rat it was rat in stereo I well the, the little the little black one's not much bigger than a rat <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah there's like your girl went by and then two little dogs followed yeah, there's her two, there's, like, there's, there's two they grow our dogs a little bigger out west <laughs> <laughs> i've seen hosses chew toys that were bigger than that <laughs> uh, <laughs> here hold on a minute we're adults here. We can all handle it. So, uh, getting back on on topic here, you know, uh, we just talked about opportunities. That's why we got into long range hunting, especially out west here, is because obviously you get more opportunities. Um, I think something you know that was kind of in in line with uh, you guys were talking about equipment and recoil management and things like that. I had a, a rude awakening a couple years ago, getting ready for a match and. Um, had a, I don't know, hair brain is like, oh, I'm going to shoot the suppressed. I need, you know, I don't want to be the cool guy that shows up to the match with a suppressor, you know, and after two days of shooting, yeah, the concussion on your face is probably a little less grueling when you're shooting a suppressor and getting ready for it. And man, this 12 pound gun I'm shooting is just, it's beating me up and I shoot trap and then shoot big guns. And I feel like I can handle recoil pretty well. And then I started losing some accuracy, figured out the the can had loosened up a little bit and on one night and it's like, gosh, I just don't want that. So, um, got one of Avery's breaks and had a machine shop here in town, like time it the next day and stuff. Holy crap. Did that tune that thing up? I, I mean, it just took all the recoil away. And 
I was getting bruised from this thing from just shooting 10 to 15 rounds a night. And I'm like, kind of like, I'm going to shoot this thing for two full days. It was, you know, 200 rounds in two days. It was not, not very appealing. And so I, I think, um, you know, everybody makes a break out there, everybody, but having <laughs> a good break is, is, you know, leaps and bounds above, uh, I feel sorry for the guys that don't spend the money on a good break, you know, and they buy because it's cheap and they buy because this guy's a great guy and whatever that excuse may be. But when you, when you get a good break on your rifle, that was the cheapest damn thing you ever bought. <laughs> yeah, they hate them. They hate them outside the U.S., but I don't care. <laughs> oh, I know. It's I've heard that. It's like it's you're looked okay. down on if you don't shoot a suppressor when like New Zealand and stuff like you're just you're you're a redneck and you're just you're a barbarian <laughs> well they they don't they bitch about the noise and I don't care when I pay them money I want the recoil management so that's just how it's going to be <laughs> yeah. so merch link in bio here Avery tell mm-hmm. us what uh, what makes your break stand out uh, it's pixie dust and voodoo <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, we, there's a good break out on the market and we all know what the break is. And we, I wanted one that was made out of titanium and they wouldn't do it. So I knew a really good machinist that works on titanium a lot. So I showed it to him and he made one that was, it's not, it's not even a carbon copy, I believe. And, and I'm, I'm biased. So Jeff can chime in. I believe that Ken actually made it. He tweaked the back end of a little bit and even made it more shootable he brought something to the table the the port the port design is different the ports are larger and and some of the ports are angled different to Mm -hmm. control muzzle rise um he he it's not the same break and it doesn't shoot the same i've shot them both a lot and i'm not that doesn't mean the other one's a bad break but uh that that new design you go on hey it's it's uh it's the fastest rat right now you know so until the until the next rat comes along this uh this this is the break to have (laughs) yeah i I hate (laughs) jumping on and saying things about it because i am biased but i just put it on a three a 30 plus p nozzler and it's surprising how it keeps the muzzle jump down we were gonna we talked to jeff about having holes in the top but yeah i asked for it in the beginning yeah yeah Yeah, and it it keeps i I don't care now i don't need it yeah (laughs) yeah and i can't i can't necessarily say that but if you want to check out a really good break it's go to rock slide and check out the muzzle brakes. I was blown away. So you, I don't know if they're on your website yet or not, but you made me that seven, eight, 24 for this Kdex behind me. And I got to make a trip to dad's to time it, but, uh, it's three ounces, Ryan, it's a three, too. it's three ounces. And it's this freaking big, <laughs> I mean, it's four inches long and it only weighs three ounces. I was, I mean, I, I'm yeah, putting you got it on. Serial, you got model number one, so you're the yeah. test dummy. <laughs> I know. I, well, and I, I tried. I tried to time it with a file. Have you ever tried to time a break that way? You can do it with a stainless one. You cannot do it with those titanium ones. They're just too tough. Like I, I filed and filed, and I was like, <clears> I'm just going to make a, this thing out of round, so I'm going to wait. But I, yeah, I still don't have one. I've asked you. Uh, well, don't worry, Bruce and Daryl are hooking awesome. me up with a that butt rifle. Oh, I, did, I gave them a couple the other day. If maybe yeah, that, that's theirs. what they're sticking on that. No, and that's the thing, talking about recoil and shootability, you know, not not just the brakes that we make, but go do a little research on brakes. There's, like Jeff said, there is a lot of shitty ones. In my opinion, there's only three that I would put on my gun, and you'll have to go find that out for yourself because one's mine, so I don't want to be biased. <laughs> I think, tell you what, it's almost like it's kind of counterintuitive. I'm putting a three ounce titanium muzzle brake on a 40 pound rifle. <laughs> well, I bet it shoots really nice. I bet it will shoot really nice. It doesn't seem real when you're looking at them. We just got the tinies made for the little barrels, and it's like 0. 0.5 ounces. It's yeah. ridiculous. Well, yeah, the, the, uh, um, I actually weighed just for curiosity's sake a day afterwards, I weighed a T3. And it's three ounces. And I mean, you could fit the T3 inside the hole of the freaking seven eights twenty four one you made me. I think the T4 is seven ounces. Jeff, I don't know if you had yours weighed, but I think it's seven ounces or I, on I the T4. I've got all, all T3s. I haven't got any T4s. How much does the break weigh that came on your Kdex? I weighed it. Uh, it weighs fifteen ounces. Whoa. Yeah, that, that big break on my three thirty eight Terminator is seven or eight ounces. Yeah, it's almost a pound. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy 
Yep. I, so. do, I do have a question on the on back on the actual six five creed more four elk because I brought up got my phone out. I brought up some numbers. So my question is, I'm, t- I'm taking over your job for a minute, Daniel. Go for it. You're the pro. <laughs> my question is, is gun to your head. You have to, you have to use a 6.5 Creedmoor. What are you using? And I'll tell you what I'm using. If And this is the numbers that I got. It's, I, I would use a 156 burger. And uh, it says the muzzle velocity is 2540. Sorry, that's, that's the inter- that's, yeah. So I'm I'm going to use a 156 burger as well. I'm shooting it, shooting them out of this Kelby Coda that I've got uh-huh. uh, at 2610. The ES is ridiculous and the gun shoots retarded. So if so I you're, I, you're I, in 2610, 2610. That's and it's okay. that's well under pressure. There, that thing went again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tested the, uh, the little mouse. Tested, <laughs> the 155 was the first burger. Remember the 155s came out yep. and they reassigned yep. the nose yep. to get the BC up. I tested those 155s for burger and did it in a 65 Creedmoor. And uh, mm-hmm. I was running her on a chip, but I was running 2750. So I'm going to say 2675 to 2700 is going to be about all you can get out of them, but that may not shoot the best there. But You're I killed right, a lot Jeff. of animals with them. You're okay. right. I was looking at energy. It says 2700. 2525 yep. for energy. Yeah, I'd buy that. So I'm I'm shooting small yep. rifle Lapua brass. It it's got room, but it's it's retarded accurate for you know the amount of money the gun cost. It I'll be the oddball out. I'm gonna shoot 140s because I can buy burger ammo and I am lazy like that. In a creed more, so I'm just gonna shoot 140s a little bit faster and well, that, crawl crawl a little farther, I guess. How far would you shoot an elk with one of those? Under uh, under 400. Uh, I, you held a gun to my head to make me make this decision, didn't you? Mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't shoot one past 400. <laughs> gotcha, Jeff. That's a good number, 400 and in, and and good conditions and. Yep. Solid not rest. in a 20 mile an hour wind and perfect. And then, you know, and that's, this is the deal. This is where, you know, don't take that quarter and two you shot with this little sucker because it ain't going to work. You got to wait for him to be slightly quartered away or perfectly broadside. I'm, I, man, that quarter and two you shot is that's where if you ain't got a big gun, you're in big trouble. Um, so yeah, perfectly mm-hmm. sideways, everything perfect, all the stars aligned and you've, uh, paid your dues and, uh, the stars are shining on you 400 yards. <laughs> Thanks for okay. setting this up. Cause this is the perfect time to mention we do long range, right? And this is in that scenario. I can't think of any more times when you need to know when not to shoot. There's going to be a lot of them. Yeah. And the numbers at 400 yards, the velocity if you're doing 2700 with the 156 is 2216 for velocity and the energy 1700. I don't think anybody wants to push it too far. Yeah. And And there's, there's, those are good numbers and there's nothing wrong with those numbers that uh, that you'll have good bullet performance. You have good expansion. You're going to have, you know, the penetration will be there. You got enough energy, whatever you want is there. The only thing you're lacking is, it better be in the right spot because your shotgun effect inside after it goes inside and the bullet comes apart, it's a lot smaller shotgun than if you had a 30 cal. Yeah. Jeff just nailed it. It's and I've, I've said that to everyone that asked me a question It has zero to do with the bore diameter. It has to do with the mass of the fragmentation. You know, I, I don't want to put words in Jeff's mouth, but I'm pretty sure what he was thinking when he was shooting those seven, 300 wind mags and those bigger seven millimeters is when you look at it ballistically, it outperforms the 30 cows ballistically and it has the same energy on impact, but the, the a, mass is not there. It, I it had is, a stack of barrels. I had a stack of barrels on top of the guns. When that 195 burger came out, I'm like, Holy moly. Look at the BC. Look at this. I know what I can pro- propel this thing out of a, a 300 wind mag case. Uh, I don't want to, you know, the barrel life's going to be reasonable. It's got everything checked here. I took them guns side by side out. My 300 wind mag. I had a barrel for the 300 wind mag. I was going to pull that barrel off. You know, all I had to do is change a bushing in the dies, use the same brass. I was ready to do it. And I built some of them seven 300s. And uh, we went out there to do that. That was the year of the managed 
management hunt when we killed those 76 elk and uh he'll, we killed i don't know how many like 40 elk before the during that management hunt before the season opened in the same hay field in the same blind every night and it was a blind i could lay down program and prone in and i had i'd take hunters out there and many a nights we had two rifles the 7 300 and the 300 wind mag a 195 burger and a 215 burger side by side and religiously Many, many, many of the shots from the 7300 took two to put them down. And that's a deal where you got 200 head of elk feeding into that hay field. And the first shot you're going to get when they hit the edge of the hay field and start grazing is 450 yards. And we take two elk a lot of time, but religiously, that's that. that why does it make that much difference? I, I tried and tried and tried to figure it out. I can't tell you. I'm just telling you what I saw over and over and over again. Yeah, there's, I, I think I've talked to this about about this with a lot of people is you can bring all the numbers you can bring all the math you want ballistically your 28 nozzle will win but when you start shooting stuff there's something else going on there when you put a 30 caliber plus bullet inside a large animal like an elk it's different <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's that much it really there's not there i mean there's such a small area but I, i've seen too many big game animals shot well with a seven mag or seven millimeter, anything. And they just needed a second one for whatever reason. And I'm not saying I've never put a second 30 cal. Doesn't, mean they, elk. doesn't mean they weren't going to die. We're right. not saying that at all because, but I'm just telling you, it's getting dark. The sagebrush is five feet tall, right above the hay field up there in the Hills. And it's getting dark. I try to find what an elk that went down up there and that stuff. You know what? I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> all you're doing is that headlamp is making shadows. So you can't see it. You're better off to you better pray for a moonlight night and to, or, or good snow that the the herd when it left didn't stomp out the tracks. But mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't find it until morning, and if, especially if it's an early fall hunt like that, if you don't find it until morning, the coyotes just ate your hams and probably one of your back straps, and the birds have crapped all over it. And you know it's a disgusting situation. You need to find them. You need to know where they're going to go down. Like I said, I'm not saying they don't die. They're going to die. They just don't go down quick enough. Ryan, Furman ruined the whole podcast bringing up 284s. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far uh, as elk. He's got the market cornered on him, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gun safe, full of them. As far as elk are concerned, uh, they fit into the same discussion as the uh, six fives. It, it's not something I'm taking. I mean, they have their place. They, they all have their place, but it's not. Oh, hell. It's not right. shooting long range elk. I mean, who here doesn't have at least two six five Creedmoors? I mean, before the PR season stuff, I mean, we all got them. We all love them. You know, they're never. they're great, great round. Quit never it, quit it. I have a quit six it. Creedmoor. It, it's gay other brother, but it's you know. <laughs> got one of those too. I got a six, a six five Creedmoor, a six five Creedmoor AR ten. Went full potato there. So yeah, well, I think this is a. Uh, pretty good uh, timeline. Is there any subjects we haven't caught, fought, we haven't uh, touched? I think we've pretty much answered the question. Is a, I mean, for Furman's sake, is a six five or a seven millimeter anything an elk rifle? Um, I guess it can be, but it's not. Uh, you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. I think so we to speak. touched on it. Six hundred yards is starting to make make the situation to where you be you need to be on your game, which is also why I think we, you know, why I advocate for uh, 30 cal or even bigger. I got into long range shooting. I started buying equipment. I started practicing for the opportunities. And I'm not out west and put myself in a situation where I wish I had more guns. So if I'm going elk hunting, I'm taking a 30 cal. And I personally haven't found a better performing bullet on elk than the 215. Now, the 230 burger gets it done. The 300 burger, I guarantee, would get it done. But, you know, when you talk about the entire shooting package, the 215 is pretty close to, if not the pinnacle of putting animals down. Um, deer and antelope, those are whole whole different discussions. And I, I, I personally, when I go to Africa, I will continue to take the 215 burger out of, a, you know, my favorite 30 cal. So it's, it comes down about, comes down to opportunities. That's why I started to, you know, getting into the long range shooting game. And I think that the six, five cartridges 
limit your opportunities. Like we've all said, we know they're going to kill animals. Um, and if you are ethical about your shot placement or your shot distance, I guess I should say, because you can't always control where the bullet's going, you know, things do happen, whether we admit it or not. The six fives just limit uh, your your distance. So I'm taking a 30 cal into the elk woods every time. So you, the ball is hanging there, and I, I just got to swing. I just got to say it. He's set it up perfectly. You know, we, <laughs> I've said it before. You can chop down a tree with a claw hammer, but it's not the greatest tool for the job. Uh, absolutely. And I'll, I'll just say the, the number one thing that we should all strive for, and you guys do long range right, is a quick death to the animal. The fastest way for a quick death to the animal is a big ass wound channel. So you need to shoot a heavy for caliber match bullet, in my opinion, to make that happen. Yeah, we we need to emphasize that we haven't done a good job during this podcast. We aren't telling you to go shoot 150 grain 30 cal. That defeats the purpose. We're talking about shooting 215s, 230s. I'm, I don't have experience with the 245 burger, but that would be another good option. I think I would take the mass and the momentum over velocity every day. But you do have to make sure that you're still within those constraints that we talked about. Uh, whatever your magical number is, I like to stay above 1,000 foot-pounds of energy and roughly 1,800 foot-pounds uh, on impact velocities. But those larger bullets for caliber are what we're talking about. We're not talking about shooting 168 yeah, don't, grain. Don't handicap you can handy, handicap a rifle and make it work just like a smaller rifle if you want to put the small bullets in it. And that's what all them gun riders like to do. Well, let's compare a 6.5 Creedmoor to a 300 Wind Mag and then put a 150 grain bullet in a 300 Wind Mag. Well, why would you do that? You know, <laughs> why, why would you do that? Why would you handicap the superior tool? So, so you can anyway, sell something. There you go. So somebody will read my rev chip on it. Did somebody say 6.8 Western? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I, I don't even know what it is <laughs> it's a, nostalgic it's a 277 psalm <laughs> uh, there's something about that word psalm you know it's just like uh what are some of them other words that make you cringe <laughs> like hemi no i know it's a good cartridge a lot of guys like it it's just uh, i like them long cartridges yeah so yeah i think we pretty well covered it there guys uh Unless you guys got anything to add to it, uh, I think we're all in agreement that a, a 6.5 Creedmoor is not an elk rifle, um, not preferred elk rifle. If, if it's what you got and it's what you shoot the best and you're good at getting close to them, I wouldn't wouldn't discourage anybody to go hunting. But um, when you're ready to start, stack the cards in your favor, I think we can all can agree it's uh, better to take a bigger rifle. Yeah, can't say it better than that. Right. Well, on that, uh, I think we'll close it. Mr. Avery, I appreciate you uh, joining us and helping kick, helping, uh, helping us all kick it off for the first time. And uh, hopefully we can share this on both our channels. And uh, hopefully this is a start to something really fun and really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes. I got to throw this out to anyone who's listening. Uh, head on over to longrangeonly.com and, and let us know uh you know what you thought what you want to hear we'll try to cover some some topics that you guys uh are interested in give us feedback so we can make some changes all right guys for that dad you got anything else nope thanks everybody right. for listening i appreciate you tuning in all right we'll see you guys next time